Okay, Lethal Company is a difficult game, but equipment can make it a whole lot easier. It's important to know which equipment is worth buying and which equipment isn't. I'll be ranking every piece of equipment and be giving in-depth guides to them. So I think it's worth watching the whole video if you really want to understand all the ins and outs of the game. A quick note before the tier list starts, and I don't like doing this, but I'm really pushing to hit a thousand subscribers and I'm trying to level up my content with every new video. So I would really appreciate it if we hit a thousand before April. I'll be doing more content aside from Lethal Company and I might do analysis or review type videos as well. So please let me know in the comments what you want to see next. There are two types of equipment I'll be ranking in this list. The first being player equipment which takes a slot in your inventory and the other being ship equipment which is an upgrade that's a part of the ship and can only be used in the ship. Oh and the tier list is in no particular order so items at the top of B tier aren't any better than those at the bottom of B tier but everything in B tier is obviously better than C, D and F. Anyway, without further ado let's get into the Lethal Company Equipment tier list. There's only one item in F tier, and that is the flashlight. The regular flashlight is 15 credits, weighs nothing, and has a weak light beam. I don't see anyone using this, unless they're new to the game, and I can see why. It has half the battery life of the pro flashlight, and has a much weaker light source. The only benefits the regular flashlight has over the pro, is that it's 10 credits cheaper, and 5 pounds lighter. But the money and weight doesn't really matter in this instance, because the main problem is that these items are going to take up a slot in your inventory, leaving you with only 3 slots for loot. So, there's absolutely no reason you would take the regular flashlight over the Pro, it's just worse in every aspect, and its battery dies so quickly that half the time you'll take it in, the battery will die, and you'll end up discarding it for a piece of loot. Here's a time lapse of the battery life compared to the time of day. I'm going to be doing this for every item that has a battery life, so you can get a general understanding of how long they last. The regular flashlight has a battery life of 2 minutes and 20 seconds, and as you can see that's about 3 in-game hours, from 8am to 11am. Yeah, it's seriously bad, and the only item in F tier for obvious reasons. You should never buy the regular flashlight, just buy the Pro instead. Moving on to DT, I'm going to put the boom box here. Unlike the flashlight, the boom box actually has a use, just not a very good one. The boom box costs 60 credits and weighs quite a lot at 16 pounds, making it a little bit inconvenient to bring in. And aside from the sick beats it plays, and I'll link to all 5 songs the boom box can play in the description. The only other use the boom box really has is luring high grodeers, because when you are playing the boom box, they will speed up significantly and chase you. But they will stop next to you and won't kill you, making it very easy to lure them into a dead end room and lock them in. You can use it to lure dogs, but it's not very good, and just buying a walkie talkie from the ship is so much better and cheaper, since the ice cream song jingle is super loud and always distracts the dogs. It has a battery life of 5 minutes and 40 seconds, and therefore it'll last you to about 4pm when being used constantly. Overall, I think it's useful to have a boombox on the ship if you have the spare credits, because while slimes are rare, they can be annoying and camp the front door, or just make it harder to loot. But it's not like you can't trap them without the boombox, you absolutely can, it just takes a lot longer. So keep them on the ship, and bring them in if there's a slime, but honestly, it's more of a fun item, and I think it belongs in D tier, although it is pretty funny when everyone around you is dying and you're just listening to a smooth beat. Also in D tier is the Zap Gun. The Zap Gun is incredibly overpriced at 400 credits. It weighs 11 pounds and it's designed to stun enemies. It has a battery life of 60 seconds, but the battery only drains when you're stunning something. The Zap Gun will lock onto whatever target is in front of you, even other players, and then shoot an electrical current that stuns them. They can't move and they can't attack when in their stun state. It sounds really useful. I mean, being able to completely immobilize an enemy in Lethal Company sounds great, because they are all so dangerous. But in practice, the Zap Gun sucks. The main use for the Zap Gun is to stun an enemy, 
while the other players attack it with shovels. But this is far from its best use. Firstly, every enemy that can be damaged can be killed with nothing but a shovel. That includes the Bracken and the Eyeless Dogs without using any exploits. And sure, maybe the Zap Gun makes it a little bit easier, but now you need multiple people to kill a single enemy. And I would have put the Zap Gun a little higher on the list if the shotgun didn't exist. Before the shotgun and the shovel buff which changed its weight to 8 pounds, the zap gun was the only way to kill the bracken. But now you can kite him with a shovel, or just walk up to him and blast him with a shotgun. So the zap gun isn't good for killing enemies at all. And it's overshadowed by the shotgun and the shovel. Surely it has other uses right? Well, not really. Aside from the jester which is by far the zap gun's best use, as it can stall the jester's wind up, and reset its speed once popped every time you zap it. It doesn't really have any other use. You can stun the giant, but after every stun there's a 5 second cooldown on the gun, and the giant will just continue sprinting towards you when the zap ends, and kill you. And it seems to not even reset the thump of speed. So as much as I love the zap gun, and hope that in future updates it's made cheaper, and shovels are nerfed a little bit, making it so the zap gun shovel combo is a more viable strategy. Right now, you can just run in with nothing but a shovel and kill anything that moves. So, the zap gun, while I love the concept, is in desperate need for a buff or a rework, and it's going in D tier. Moving on to C tier, we're starting with the extension ladder. The extension ladder is cool, but it doesn't have many uses. It's 60 credits and surprisingly weighs nothing. Basically, it's a box that you drop, and it will extend into a ladder for 18 seconds before attracting. There's only three main uses for the ladder. That being the offense fire exit, the dying fire exit, and the titan strategy where you drop items near the ship using the ladder. Now, the problem is, both the offense fire exit and the dying fire exit have alternate routes that don't involve the ladder. For the offense fire exit, you can either jump from the ship onto this pipe or climb this rock, but it's fairly difficult. The dying fire exit is much more simple though. All you have to do is go to this little ridge here, run up it with full stamina and jump at the last second and then continue to spam the jump button until you get a sweet spot that will let you jump up. So aside from the titan method, the extension ladders are sort of like training wheels for new players that don't know the weird methods to get up to high spots. You can also jetpack up to all of these places, and I don't want to hear any comments saying the ladder can be used to cross gaps indoors, because that is absolutely pointless. As much as I've shamed it in this section, the ladder definitely has its uses, so it's going in C tier. Also in C tier is the TZP Inhalant. The TZP Inhalant is a stimulant that when used will decrease stamina consumption and give a speed boost depending on how long it's inhaled. It's quite expensive at 120 credits but weighs nothing. There are three types of status effects the TZP Inhalant gives you based on how long you use it. I will be playing footage of me racing with the different stages of TZP so you can gauge just how much speed boost it actually gives you. Starting with light status, this occurs when you inhale TZP for 4 seconds and gives you a slight movement speed buff and stamina efficiency buff. However the downside is minor visual impairment, and the buffs last for 6 seconds, and the debuffs last for 12 seconds. Heavy status occurs after 8 seconds of use, and gives you a moderate speed buff and stamina efficiency buff. The debuffs are moderate visual impairment, and minor slippery controls. The buffs last for 24 seconds and the debuffs last for 36 seconds. Overdose is the final status and it occurs after 12 seconds of inhaling TZP. The buffs are major speed increase and stamina efficiency increase, but the debuffs are heavy visual and auditory impairment, slippery controls and screen distortion. The buffs last for 36 seconds and the debuffs last for 42 seconds. So there's clearly a strategy to using TZP. The longer you inhale it, the greater the risk and also the reward. 
so you can use it however you like, but in my opinion, the fact that it takes an inventory slot and is quite pricey, I wouldn't waste it on the light status effect. And the other two effects obscure your vision so much that it's almost not worth it ever. I have seen a strategy where you jetpack every small item to the ship and use a TZP to transport the heavy items on Rand. But this is really hard to do, especially with the Rand fire exit. And the only reason this is a viable strategy is because when you start hitting the really high quotas, you're left with a bunch of money that you don't really have much use for. Which really shows why the TZP is down in C tier. It's mainly used when you have a bunch of spam money laying around, and even then, it isn't a crazy good item. It's really gimmicky and really expensive. It doesn't last long, and I've seen people argue that it's the only way to get Beehive solo, but that's just flat out wrong. There's plenty of strategies to get Beehive solo, but you can also just do it with nothing if you know how to kite them. The TZP definitely needs a buff. Either it should be cheaper, last longer, or the visual impairment shouldn't be as harsh. Even at 50% off and only 60 credits, I would still rather buy two stun grenades at full price. TZP is going in C tier because it's not really that useful, but I've seen some pretty good plays with it. Also in C tier is the first ship upgrade on the list, and that's the Loud Horn. The Loud Horn costs 100 credits and is really simple. You pull the cord and it makes a noise that everyone can hear, even if they're inside the facility. The best use for the horn is to put it by the front of the ship and hold it down to attract dogs away from the door, allowing safe access into the ship. Or you could use it as a signal and set up codes like a short pull means a giant, two short pulls mean earth leviathan, and one long pull means dogs. But with the addition of the signal translator, it's nowhere near as good for that. So honestly, it's not that useful, but I've put it in C tier because there's no downside to having it. I definitely would prioritize the teleporter and the signal translator first, but if you have extra credits, you may as well buy this. The loud horn is going in C tier. Starting in B tier is the Pro Flashlight. The Pro Flashlight costs 25 credits and it weighs 5 pounds. It's better than the regular flashlight in every way. It has a stronger light beam and lasts twice as long. The battery on a Pro Flashlight lasts 5 minutes, so the Pro Flashlight will go from 8am to 3pm when being used constantly. But the best way to use both the flashlight and the Pro Flashlight is to turn it on when you need to see and keep it off to save battery when you know where you're going. With this method, the Pro Flashlight should last you nearly the entire day. The Pro Flashlight is a pretty cool item. It doesn't offer a huge advantage, but it feels like the game was designed for you to play with one. It just makes the whole game feel smoother, and there are a few applications where it actually is needed. Sometimes the interior will start with the lights turned off by default, and a flashlight is really helpful there. It's helpful for spotting turrets and seeing which way they are pointing. Snare fleas are easier to see, and it makes outdoor exploration at night easier. It's pretty much suicide to go to Ren's fire exit at night without one of these. Another thing to note is that both the Pro Flashlight and the regular flashlight will stay on even when you switch to another item, making it less of a burden to carry. Although for some reason bottles are the only scrap that blocks the flashlight. Pro Flashlights are going in B tier right in the middle of the list because I feel like they are perfectly balanced and fairly useful. Also in B tier is the Radar Booster. Costing 60 credits and weighing 19 pounds, the Radar Booster is pretty cheap for what it does. But it requires at least two people to use. The Radar Booster is fairly complicated, so I'll try and get into everything. When purchasing a Radar Booster, it will be assigned a random name which can be seen by scanning it. The name is important for all of the Radar Booster's users. For the Radar Booster to work, you need someone on the ship terminal being the operator, and you need another person holding the Radar Booster out while it's turned on, being the user. Both players need to have an understanding of how the Radar Booster works, otherwise it's useless. Firstly, the Radar Booster acts as a camera extension for the terminal on the ship, so it can be used to scan areas inside for threats that may have spawned. You can also use this as a loot drop-off station by putting the Radar Booster in between an entrance and the main maze area, meaning you can drop off all of your loot at the Radar Booster instead of going all the way to the entrance 
and even if you die, everyone else will see how much loot you got, where it is, and how many enemies are around it. And they can decide whether or not it's worth going to get it. It's sort of hard to explain, but I have seen this strategy used really well to get consistent high quota titan runs. The second use of the radar booster is probably the one you're going to use the least, and it requires the person on the terminal to type in ping Sam, or whatever name is given to your radar booster. Typing this in on the terminal will ping the radar booster making it say, Hello? This attracts enemies and can be used as a messaging system to the user of the radar booster. For example, the operator could ping the radar booster whenever the user is near loot. But with the signal translator and walkie talkies existing, it's not all that useful. The final use for the radar booster is the flash command. The flash command is activated by the operator typing flash sam, or whatever name the radar booster has. Putting this command into the terminal causes the radar booster to flash a bright light, similar to the stun grenades. It will stun enemies but also temporarily blind any players near it or holding it. It has infinite flashes and a short cooldown, so as long as the operator of the terminal knows what they are doing, it can be a very effective tool against certain entities. Starting with giants, they are highly vulnerable to the radar booster, because if a player is holding the radar booster out and is picked up by a giant, the terminal operator can flash and it will cancel the giant's kill animation and stun him for 6 seconds, making it impossible to be killed by a giant when holding one of these. You can also drop it on the giant and continually stun him. This does force one player to the ship though, which is the downside. The Jester is another entity that's vulnerable to the radar booster. If you drop the radar booster on the Jester while he is winding, and the terminal operator spams the flash command, the Jester will take twice as long to finish its song due to being stunned. This obviously gives everyone else a bunch more time to get out of the facility and is especially helpful on Titan. Not only this, but once the Jester is popped, you can use the radar booster to effectively remove him from the game. All you have to do is kite him back and forth around the radar booster and have the terminal operator spamming the flash command. This works because the Jester's speed is reset whenever he is flashed, making him really easy to kite and avoid. So the radar booster is pretty much the best item in the game against the Jester, but once again this takes two people to do, and I don't think it's worth wasting two people just to remove the Jester from the game. Still, it's definitely something to consider, as the Jester is one of those enemies that can just kill everyone, especially on Titan, and if you have a radar booster, it's better to waste time than it is for everyone to die. Snare fleas are also really vulnerable to the radar booster. Basically, if you are carrying a radar booster around inside and you have someone operating it, you are immune to snare fleas, since if they jump on your head, the terminal operator can flash and it will fall off your head and run away as if you were hit with a shovel. Obviously snare fleas are already counted by shovels, so the giant and jester counters are more important, but it's still pretty handy to not have to worry about snare fleas. Masts are another entity which can be countered with the radar booster. If you are holding a radar booster and the mast grabs you, the terminal operator can flash and it will cancel the killing animation. A bunch of other enemies get stunned, but I think these are the only ones I would use the radar booster on, because you have to remember that when flashing it, you get blinded too so it should only really be used in emergency situations, like if you're being killed, or if the jester is winding. Yeah, the radar booster is really complicated, and this is the kind of stuff that makes the game fun. There's a whole meta to this one item, and it can either be garbage if the two people using it don't know what they're doing, or it can be really good if they do. But I'm only going to put it in B tier, despite its low cost and versatility, purely because it requires two people to use, which is a huge downside. Moving on in B tier, this one should be a lot briefer than the radar booster, because it's the lock picker. The lock picker is a fairly simple item, it costs 20 credits and weighs 16 pounds. The lock picker can be used to open an infinite number of locked doors, but it takes 30 seconds per door. It's always handy to have a lock picker on the ship, and because of its low cost I've put it in B tier, but it certainly has its downsides compared to the regular keys. Obviously it's quite heavy, whereas keys are weightless and it takes 30 seconds to open a door whereas keys are instant. But because of its infinite uses, and the fact that keys can sometimes be scarce, lock pickers have their moments. I think the best use for a lock picker is when you're going to fire exits because they have like 3 locked doors near them, and mainly the Ren fire exit because it's so far away and if you don't bring one of these and hit a locked door, you will be forced all the way back to the ship. So lock pickers aren't anything crazy. But because of their low cost, you can bring them to the fire exit just in case, and they don't really take an inventory slot, 
since it's only 20 credits, so if you leave the lockpicker behind, it's not too much of a problem. So I think lockpickers deserve B tier. Last in B tier is another ship upgrade, and that is the inverse teleporter. The inverse teleporter is the most expensive ship upgrade, costing 425 credits. Once purchased, it can be activated by the yellow button next to the ship's monitor. Pressing the yellow button activates the inverse teleporter, and anyone who steps inside of it will be teleported to a random location inside the facility. Now this is great for getting inside quickly, and ignoring any outdoor danger doing so. There are a few problems though. You don't know where you are, you can't take any items with you, and you have nowhere to take all the loot you find, and if you run into a coil head or a jester or anything really, since you can't take a shovel, you are most likely dead. And that's the best case scenario, because you can be teleported right next to turrets, over pits, in locked rooms, and much worse. It's high risk and high reward, and it's best to have someone on the ship when you inverse in, so they can teleport you out if you're lost. The inverse teleporter has a cooldown of 3.5 minutes, making it usable about twice in a single run. It definitely has its uses, especially on eclipsed moons, but it's a bit of a gamble using this, and you can't bring anything with you, so I'm going to put it in the middle of the list in B tier. Moving on to A tier, we're getting into the really effective equipment here. Starting with walkie talkies. This is going to be another quick one, since the concept is really simple. It's the cheapest item in the game, costing 12 credits, and it weighs nothing. However, you will need at least two of them, and at least two players for it to work. Walkie talkies allow long distance communication, and are especially useful when one person is on the ship, and the other three players are inside with walkie talkies. This allows the ship person to communicate to everyone where loot is, what enemies have spawned, what time it is, who's alive, and so much more. It's a really simple concept, but it's very effective when used right. The walkie talkies are four way, meaning if everyone has a walkie talkie, they can all talk to each other on the same channel, no matter where they are. It does have battery, but it lasts longer than an entire day, so you won't need to charge it until you finish to run. So, really good communication tool, really cheap, and it basically has infinite battery. It's gonna go in A tier. It is useless if you're playing solo, obviously, but that doesn't affect its ranking at all. Also in A tier is the stun grenade. The stun grenade costs 30 credits and is fairly light at 4 pounds. It's a non-lethal explosive that will stun most entities for an amount of time, which is based on their stun multiplier. Once the pin is pulled, the grenade will detonate after 3 seconds. If it's not thrown, it will do 20 damage to the player that's holding it. I'm going to quickly go over every enemy that can be stunned and how long they are stunned by the stun grenade. So snare fleas can be stunned for 15 seconds, bunker spiders for 5 seconds, Hoarding Bugs for 2.5 seconds, The Bracken for only 1.25 seconds, Thumpers for 5 seconds, Hygro Deers for 20 seconds, Spore Lizards for 3 seconds, Nutcrackers for 2.5 seconds, Coil Heads for 16.25 seconds, which is actually quite useful, Jesters for 3 seconds, Mast for 3.75 seconds, Eyeless Dogs for 3.5 seconds, Giants for 6 seconds, Baboon Hawks for 2 seconds, and Manticoils for 5 seconds. The Stun Grenade is definitely the most effective against Giants, because you can either throw it at a Giant, stunning them for 6 seconds and giving you enough time to get away, or you can pull the pin before a Giant picks you up, which saves you from the killing animation. After the grenade is used, you will be left with a Dummy Grenade, which may seem useless at first, but it's really effective at clearing landmines, which is not something you would go out of your way to do, but it's just an added bonus to bringing a stun grenade into the facility. Overall, I think the stun grenade is pretty underrated, but everyone knows it's really effective on giants, so it's A tier material. Moving on in A tier, there is an item which I think is even more underrated, and that is spray paint. Spray paint is 50 credits and weighs nothing. I used to never use spray paint, and I just thought it was a troll item to spray paint the ship and other people, but it's actually really good and even game changing when you use it properly. One thing you'll notice in the game is that every corridor looks so similar that you will find yourself going to the same place like 10 times trying to find the exit or trying to go deeper into the facility for loot. But with the spray can, you can just simply put a dot or two dots on every dead end and you will never backtrack again. Everyone can see the spray paint, making it so much easier to loot. If you set up a system with the other players, 
For example, one dot means the door leads to the entrance, two dots mean dead end, and three dots mean apparatus. You can sweep the facility so quickly. You have four people knowing exactly where to go and exactly where not to go. It is a little pricey at 50 credits, but it lasts a long time, especially if you just use dots to mark places. It usually lasts me at least two rounds, and I think if used properly, it's 100% an A tier item. Moving down A tier, next up are keys. These were kind of hard to rank, since you can't buy them and they are found throughout the facility. They serve one purpose, which is they open locked doors. But considering that they are weightless, there's no reason not to pick them up, and it's always handy to have a couple on the ship. You can also use them as lightning rods, or to kill dogs with lightning on stormy moons since they are conductive. There's not much else to say, they are obviously better than the lock picker, but you can't buy them. So they were pretty hard to rank, but I'm happy putting them in A tier. Finally, the last equipment in A tier, which is another ship upgrade, is the signal translator. The signal translator is a super handy upgrade to the ship that costs only 255 credits. The signal translator allows the operator of the ship's terminal to send a 9 character message to everyone at once. This can be repeated infinitely with a short 5 second cooldown. There are a bunch of codes you can come up with, but here are a few. Brack means there's a bracken near someone. Coil means there's a coil near someone. Giants means there's giants outside. Dogs means there's dogs outside. Worms means there's worms outside. Snare means there's a snare flea near someone. Jester means there's a jester whining the facility. You get the idea. The ship operator can also tell everyone who's inside and can't see the time what time it is, and give them updates every 2 hours by typing stuff like 2pm, 4pm, 6pm, 8pm and 10pm. This allows everyone inside to carefully consider how deep into the facility they're going to go, and if they should leave yet. The signal translator is especially useful against jesters, since without it, people might not know there's a jester whining on the other side of the map, and then they go really deep into the facility and get killed. Anyway, I'll put a bunch of common codes that are used on the signal translator in the description because I don't really want to be spending a long time talking about every single code that you can make because really, it's up to you what kind of codes you want to use but the ability to send a message to everyone at once, no matter where they are, is great and that's why the signal translator is going in A tier. We're finally in S tier, and these are some of the best equipment in the game. Starting with an obvious one, the shovel. The shovel might honestly be a little overpowered at the moment. It costs 30 credits and weighs 8 pounds. Kiting enemies is quite easy, and once you have enough experience, you can run into the facility with a shovel, and only have to worry about jesters and coil heads. You can just kill everything else. Spiders take 5 hits to kill, but are super easy to kite. You just have to hit them in the fangs while moving backwards. Make sure you have enough room to walk backwards so you don't back into a wall and you'll be fine. Snare fleas are completely countered by the shovel, since if they jump on your head, you can pick your shovel up and hit them off. Hoarding bugs are easily put down with 2 shovel hits. Thumpers die in 4 shovel hits, but they can be tricky to kite. Once you've killed a few thumpers though, they aren't too difficult, and you can either hit them and move back or run them in circles. Nutcrackers are fairly hard to fight the legitimate way, but the crouch method makes it really easy. They take 5 hits to kill and I'll quickly explain the crouch method. You run up to the nutcracker when it's in its scanning phase, hit it once, crouch and move backwards. If he is going to move then stay back, and if he is going to shoot and not move then go up real close to him and start hitting him. Right after he shoots you need to move back again to make sure he doesn't kick you, and then repeat. Basically, when he's going to shoot, be under his gun so he can't hit you, and if he's going to move, take a few steps back so he doesn't run into you and kick you. Brackens are probably the hardest indoor enemy to kill with the shovel, but he isn't too hard if you fight him in a large room. You just have to stare at him to get him angry, and then run him in circles while hitting him. Hit him only 3 times and he dies. Obviously he can one shot you if you mess up, so it's a big risk to take, but it's fairly reliable. Masks take 4 hits to kill and can be annoying to kite, because they can unexpectedly start running at you. But if you play it safe and wait for them to stop running, they aren't too difficult. Baboon hawks are annoying to kite, but like the mast, you just need to play it carefully. Get a couple hits in, then back off. They don't one shot you, but they can very quickly pick at your health, especially when there's multiple. And eyeless dogs take 12 hits to kill, but you can get them stuck in all types of places and kill them, 
or if you can, kite them, but it's really easy for them to kill you doing this method, so it's pretty risky. The shovel is cheap, can kill everything in the game that isn't invincible, it can clear spider webs, anger turrets, and it's light at only 8 pounds. I don't see any reason why I wouldn't put the shovel in S tier. Also in S tier is another weapon, that being the shotgun. The shotgun drops from a nutcracker after it's killed, along with two shotgun shells. It's technically a scrap item since you find it inside the facility, and therefore if everyone dies, all the shotguns on the ship will be deleted. It weighs 16 pounds and since it can't be purchased at the store, it can instead be sold for anywhere from 30 to 90 credits, which is just an added bonus to this weapon. It does 5 damage at close range which means it one shots every indoor enemy. It's especially useful against the Bracken which can be difficult to kite with a shovel, but becomes a complete joke when you have a shotgun. Baboon hawks can also be killed with a shotgun, but you need to hit them once with a shovel after shooting them to finish them off and Arlis dogs are immune to the shotgun, and it's not worth using it on them at all. The shotgun is a more reliable and noob friendly shovel. The only thing you need to pay attention to when using a shotgun is the safety, because if the safety is off it can misfire. Apart from that, the shotgun is a point, shoot and win weapon. There are some glitches where some enemies can be immune to it, and you should be prepared for that, but those are glitches, so it doesn't affect the ranking. Another reason the shotgun is so good it's because you can one-shot nutcrackers and make them extremely easy to kill, which means once you get one shotgun, you can easily get a whole collection of them. The shotgun completely changes the game once you get it, and I feel like it would be a disservice to put it anywhere other than S tier. Also in S tier is the jetpack. I think the jetpack is the most balanced item in S tier, because unlike the shotgun which has a low skill ceiling, the jetpack is really hard to use. It costs 700 credits and weighs 52 pounds. The jetpack allows you to traverse the map in ways no other item could. You can fly to the skybox, you can cross maps in seconds, you can get on top of everything, lure creatures away, and so much more. As a beginner, you'll probably blow the jetpack up, crash into everything and die. As an amateur, you'll be able to control the jetpack and fly back and forth from entrances to the ship, speeding up the looting process significantly. And as an expert, you'll be able to fly low to the ground, lure enemies away perfectly, and pull off stunts. The jetpack is insanely good for Rend and Dine, since they have long distances between the entrance and the ship, and they mostly have small items which is really good, because you can't carry two handed items when flying a jetpack. If the moon is stormy, you can fly low to the ground, and when you hear sparking, land and drop items. This is really hard to do though, and it goes to show that the jetpack in the right hands can be the best item in the game. Similar to the shovel, if you don't know how to use it, it's not going to go well for you, but if you are really good with it, it's easily one of the best items in the game. It's definitely pricey at 700 credits, but when you're really high quota, price doesn't matter. And the jetpack is 100% worth it if you're playing Rend, which is objectively the best moon in the game. The jetpack isn't so great on Titan though, since the ship is so close to the entrance. But the jetpack, while not being great on Titan, it's still good on every other moon. Not just Rend and Dine, because being able to quickly fly between the main entrance and the fire exit is incredibly useful. I'm only an amateur with the jetpack, but it's already a must have purchase when I'm doing a high quota run. Oh, and it's great on eclipsed, flooded, rainy and foggy moons, since you can just fly over everything. The jetpack definitely belongs in S tier. It's great when you get to use it, and I recommend trying to get good with it, since it's also really fun to use. And finally in S tier, the last equipment on the list is a ship upgrade, and of course it's the teleporter. The teleporter is likely the first ship upgrade you'll buy, and it should be. It costs 375 credits and it allows you to teleport anyone to the ship with a 10 second cooldown. They leave behind any scrap or equipment they were holding, but you could see how this is extremely useful for getting other players out of situations where they would otherwise die. Most people set up a system where players inside the facility will spin or shake if they need to be teleported. Because the ship camera shows where players are and where they are looking, this is an easy way to know if someone needs to be teleported. Walkie talkies also work well with teleporters and it's incredibly helpful for avoiding fines. Basically, if someone dies and their body is not brought back to the ship, you receive a 20% fine on however many credits you have. This would be brutal if the teleporter didn't exist, since bodies are two-handed items and sometimes they are unretrievable or in too dangerous of an area to get. The teleporter completely removes the need to pick up bodies though, 
as you can just teleport them to the ship, avoiding the fine completely. It's worth noting that there are a few instances where the body can't be teleported or picked up, and the fine is guaranteed. These being if you get eaten by a forest keeper, earth leviathan, or the company monster, and if you sink into quicksand or fall in the ocean on Gordian. Overall, the teleporter is probably the most common purchase in the game and for good reason. It can save people on a dime and it saves all of your money by basically removing fines from the game. The teleporter is definitely an S tier ship upgrade. And that's the end of the tier list, but I did leave some equipment out which I feel like didn't belong on it, but it's still worth talking about. Starting with the mapper, the mapper is a scrapped item that can only be obtained by altering the game files. It costs 30 credits and you can technically buy it in the game, but it will just appear as a shovel. It's essentially a handheld terminal camera and it's completely broken. I can definitely see why this item was removed because it makes the terminal camera and the communication between the ship operator and the player pretty useless. You can just take this in on your own and know exactly what enemies are around you, where they are, what rooms are where and where all the loot is. Yeah, it's absolutely broken and it seems like there was supposed to be a battery function, but currently it has infinite battery. So while you can't use it in the vanilla game, if you manage to get your hands on a mapper, it's easily an S tier item. I didn't put the DIY flashbang in because it's a scrap item, and yeah, while the shotgun is too, it's never really worth using the DIY flashbang because it's trash. It's essentially a stun grenade but you can't throw it, so you have to blind yourself and damage yourself to use it. There's no reason you wouldn't just use a stun grenade unless there's some major emergency where for some reason you only have a DIY flashbang. It also doesn't leave a dummy grenade, so you can't use it to clear landmines, and once you use it, it's gone and you can't sell it. I think the DIY flashbang would go in D tier. I wouldn't put it in an F tier because at least it has some value and you can sell it. Binoculars are another scrapped item, but they don't do anything in the game currently. We can assume that they would be used for zooming in, which sounds terrible. There's almost no circumstance where you would need to zoom in outdoors or even indoors. So it makes sense why this was scrapped and it would probably go in D tier. I just feel like the binoculars wouldn't have a huge purpose. Although, I think something like night vision goggles would be a good addition to the game. Maybe they would have like a 3 minute battery life, and you would be able to see through fog and darkness perfectly. But as the battery drains, they get less effective or more glitchy. They would be pretty heavy and quite pricey at 500 credits or so and like 40 pounds. I think it would fit well in the game and it'd be a good counter to foggy and eclipsed, kind of like the jetpack. The yield sign and stop sign are just heavier and worse versions of the shovel, so there's no reason why you should be using them, unless like the DIY flashbang you were in an emergency and this is all you have. But the yield sign is twice the weight of the stop sign, so I'd probably put the stop sign in C tier and the yield sign in D tier. Shotgun shells are essential to using the shotgun. Nutcrackers drop two shotgun shells when they die, and I didn't rank these because, I mean, it's hard to rank ammo. Shotgun shells are just there to make the shotgun harder to use, but seeing as they are needed for shotguns and the shotgun is really effective, the shells would probably be in B tier. The survival kit is a bundle of items you can buy for 138 credits. It gives you 4 regular flashlights, 4 walkie talkies and 1 shovel. There's no discount as all these items add up to 138 credits if bought separately, and maybe I'm glitched, but whenever I try to confirm the order of the survival kit, it doesn't work. So yeah, either this is cut content or it's just glitched, but either way, there's not much reason to buy this, even if it did have a discount compared to buying everything separately. Having the regular flashlights thrown in there makes it not worth it. I guess it would go in F tier. And finally, the terminal is something I didn't rank, because you don't buy it or anything, it just comes with the ship but it's definitely still an important piece of equipment. In fact, it's the most important. Aside from the fact that you literally couldn't play the game without it, the functionality of the terminal is really useful. You can disable turrets, open doors, use radar boosters, send signal transmissions, read the bestiary for information of entities, and even if we are just considering those things, the terminal belongs in S tier. But obviously, it's a little hard to rank here. I don't think I missed anything. And this is probably my longest video yet, so I would really appreciate it if you subscribe and let me know what you want to see next and what adjustments you would make to this list. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. <laughs> yeah.